Um, good morning. I'm Edith DeShell, Dr. D, director of the EW Scripps School of Journalism. And this year we are celebrating 100 years of journalism education at Ohio University. Ohio University offered its first journalism class in 1923. And so we're celebrating 100 years of teaching journalism here. And occasionally someone will ask, well, why are you celebrating the first year? Why can't you celebrate the centennial, the, you know, the 100th anniversary of the program? And my response is, well, the E.W. Scripps School of Journalism became a school in 1982, and I don't know where I'll be in 2082. So we're, we're going to celebrate 100 years of journalism education now while I'm around to enjoy it. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out. 9.30 is by pandemic standards is pretty early, but we're glad that you're here. Um, my role is to welcome you, so welcome. We have 16 alumni who will be talking with you over the course of the next two days for this centennial symposium. I was eavesdropping on a conversation and Professor Narisa Young asked if um, any of you were familiar with the comedy series Friends. It was a comedy, right? Um, <laughs> I knew about it, but I didn't watch it. And so when you look through the program, you'll see that all the titles of each session begins with the ones who, which while I was eavesdropping on the conversation, was how each episode of Friends began. Um, so I learned something new every day. That's why I love teaching here, teaching. You just learn something new all the time. But you know me, I'm a broadcast journalist by trade. I'm not up here to talk for a long time, but I do want to welcome you and to introduce our moderator, which for this 930 session is Professor Narisa Young. Narisa and I are both Southerners. And um, I just want to thank her for the hard work that she has done to put this centennial symposium together. I'm always in awe at the level of, of detail that goes into putting on any kind of event. And as I've said before to her, she is my hero. So, Professor Young, come on up. It's your turn. Oh, to, to moderate. Oh, I get to sit down. You get to sit down. Thank you, Dr. D. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, good morning. I want to introduce our panelists for the first session. Uh, to my right, Will Edwards is a senior investing reporter at Insider, based in New York. He has graduate degrees from Ohio University and the University of Leipzig and earned his bachelor's degree at DeSales University. Edwards is from central Pennsylvania. He has interned and written for Bloomberg News, CNBC, and Bicycling and has studied or reported in France, Germany, and Tunisia. Edwards primarily covers developments in the stock market, the housing market, and the broader economy. He's interviewed some of the most influential voices in the market, including Rob Arnott, Savita Subramanian, Ken Rogoff, Rick Ryder, Mike Wilson, Cam Harvey, Thomas Terafi, Jonathan Galoob, Keith Parker, and more. To Will's right is Merrill Gottlieb, a proud member of The Post and the OU Society Professional Journalist the organization I advise, during all four years at Ohio University. As a postie, she covered the theater beat, built up the culture blog, and eventually became editor of the culture staff. After graduation, Gottlieb joined Insider, where she has spent nearly seven years moving through not only different roles, but also different departments. After having started as an editorial entertainment intern, Gottlieb led Insider's social video team for three and a half years, before transitioning to the business development team in 2020. She works across editorial, finance, legal, and tech and product to support Insider's partners, including Facebook, Yahoo, Taboola, Microsoft, YouTube, and more. While in school, Gottlieb said she never could have imagined this career path, let alone that she would become a Google Sheets power user. <laughs> applause. Uh, Gottlieb hails from Pittsburgh, but now lives in Brooklyn, New York with her partner and their rescue dog, Arthur. So welcome, Will and Merrill. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, we want to uh, talk with our alums, our accomplished alums who are here the next couple of days about their journeys uh, here and to uh, where they are now. So we're going to begin at the beginning, not the very beginning, when you were born, but the beginning. 
Uh, so what media and or professional organizations were you involved in during your time in the journalism school? I'm going to start with Meryl because I know she was part of OUSPJ in the Post. And how did that involvement help your career? So I started at the Post like day one freshman year. I just dove in and was there all four years, um, diehard Posty as we are. And I think it was, I mean, monumental to my career, both at OU and after um, just the network of people that I got to create just such a deep bond with because we all took that paper very seriously, probably too seriously. Um, but it was just a great experiment to do for four years and just to care so deeply about something um, and to put really just like blood, sweat and tears <laughs> into it every day. Um, and you get to just bond over just such like the level of commitment and care that you put toward this product, even though it's a student newspaper. And that was always something that I was really drawn to just because, you know, I like to put 100% of myself into stuff and it was great to find a ton of people who are like-minded in that way and to find everybody who could care about something at like, an, as like a student newspaper. Um, and then SPJ was great because it was doing, you know, networking with students and, but also networking across the other SPJ branches. And so it was just about like, all of these things were helping me to get out of my comfort zone and, you know, right from day one and not waiting until I was like a junior or senior, just being able to start right away in freshman year, I think was a really big um, advantage and, you know, a reason why I, I loved my time here so much because I got to just, you know, run out of the gate right away. I think that's one of the things we hear from students too, is the opportunity to get involved immediately, whereas some, at some other schools, they do have to wait. Yeah. Um, Will came here as a master's student, and so sometimes that level of involvement in a graduate program is a little bit different from an undergraduate program. So tell us a little bit about what you were doing here during your master's program and how that helped you get to where you are. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I didn't have you know so much involvement in the student media just because I think it's more probably undergrad focused, and I was here for a year and then did the year in the Leipzig afterward. Um, but probably my most like hands-on reporting experience um, here was uh, in Professor Young's uh, business reporting class. Um, so we had to cover like a company for the semester. Um, I covered Kroger Co. So that helped me really like uh, you know wrap my head around uh, markets reporting and you know reading 10K reports and stuff. So um, so yeah, that was you know super helpful and you know, probably my most hands-on uh, experience here at OU. When uh, we were in the first day of that class and Will said he had a subscription to The Economist, I was like, thank you, Jesus, for sending me this person who is already buying in to uh, business reporting. Uh, he was a great asset. Um, we'll go back to Will. I know you mentioned the business reporting class, but what other classes helped you in terms of business reporting, in terms of finding the narrative and the numbers, in terms of upping your reporting skills because you'd worked at a TV station uh, in Pennsylvania. So you already have broadcast experience when you came here. A little bit, yeah, I was an internship, but uh, another class that comes to mind was like uh, foreign correspondence I took uh, and that was like, uh, you know, more of a practicum focus. Uh, you had to write, I think, three articles throughout the semester. Or so, um, you know, and you had to, we had to basically pick a country. So I picked Tunisia, which is where I ended up going for, uh, you know, uh, the foreign correspondence scholarship uh, that they give out. But uh, you had to like uh, find sources, like five sources in tu based in Tunisia, uh, which is very difficult. Like, you know, as a student in Ohio, uh, you don't know anyone there. So you just have to like blind email people and stuff. So I think that helped me, uh, you know, get over, um, you know, this fear of reaching out to people or writing about something that maybe you don't know a ton about to start, but um, you can research and, you know, gain a, you know, much better understanding just by talking with people. And, stuff so yeah okay um Meryl any particular classes that were helpful and you don't have to give a shout out to my editing class even though you were a great student in that class I still remember some of those things from editing class it was just so ingrained in me of like the way that I think about it when we lay out like Instagram graphics and stuff and I I remember some of the lines of just like the old newspaper headline styles like how I try to apply that to the graphics nowadays um, but aside from your editing class, um, one of my all time favorites was reviewing and criticism with mm -hmm. Professor Greenwald. Um, she, that was like a class that 
for years I just waited <laughs> to get to do because I think you had to have a certain number to get into that. And it was just what I wanted to do when I was at school. I was a diehard entertainment culture reporter. And so that was like the creme de la creme of this is the class I want. And it was just every day I was that person that would probably talk way too much. And I was just very eager <laughs> about it. Um, and I, I loved that time. Um, and there's a class that I wish I took, which was the um, data reporting class with Amy Edmondson. And because now, you know, working on the business development team, I think I do a form of that just in a different way in terms of reporting to the public. It's more like a internal type of reporting. And I think at the time it felt very, um, you know, uh, overwhelming to be like, well, this is the stuff that like goes for Pulitzers, right? And that's like all it could be. But like data reporting can be so like every day and awesome and can inform like everyday reporting in such a way that I think is, is really interesting, especially nowadays with like, how interactive graphics and everything can be. And um, yeah, I'm a data nerd, so I wish I had taken it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there may be an opportunity, who knows, okay. Um, uh, we'll start uh, back with Meryl. Share a favorite memory from your time in the journalism school and why it means so much to you. And this could be anything. Uh, I mean, a real classic posty answer is just like all of the time that I spent in that newsroom, which was too much, too much. Um, but it was just, again, like it was just such a moment of just like this time of you never get that kind of experience again when you can just pour 100 percent and like nothing else. And everyone around you is like all working toward that same goal. Um, and it was a lot of fun because that is where I learned to be a reporter. I started, you know, freshman year and day one was just like, how do I do this? Cause I, I didn't, I wasn't one of those people that in high school or whatever was reporting or thought I wanted to do this. It was just something I kind of like thought that it would be interesting to do. Um, and so it was how I learned and it was really exciting. Um, and it was fun. It was like one of the first times I also got to be a manager cause I was a culture editor. And I, at the time, absolutely did not realize I was like managing my friends. Um, but it was interesting. It was such a, um, I don't know, such a weird and great time. <laughs> All right, Will. Yeah, I think this is an easy one. Uh, this is, you know, from your class. So we went to. Uh, I promise I didn't pay him to say this. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, we were sitting in the van uh, coming up in the shuttle this morning, and I was like, "Oh, I've been in this, you know, seat before." But we went to New York uh, in this big van with our business journalism uh, class, and we visited uh, the CNBC, you know, offices, and then uh, Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal as well. So that was a, uh, you know, super cool to be able to, uh, you know, take something that you're. Uh, you know, working on in class every day uh, here in Athens and then go and see people actually, uh, you know, doing it on the day to day and, and speak with them about their careers and stuff. So that was a really cool opportunity. All right. Terrific. Um, so I've talked a little bit when I introduced you about your internships, but give us an idea of that path, the different internships you had and the things you learned along the way that helped you to business insider. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I guess after after your course, uh, you know, I decided, okay, this is you know really cool. I want to try to get some experience. Um, and then actually, I applied to a, a, a fellowship or internship at at Insider, and then got denied. Uh, it was which not is funny because <laughs> now over there, but uh, uh, I ended up getting one at CNBC in San Francisco, covering like tech out in their uh, SF bureau and uh, doing like TV production. Uh, so that was really cool. And then um, you know, uh, we were able to meet, you know, some, some contacts there, I guess, uh, in, in the New York, uh, you know, bureau, but, um, and then, um, afterward, like in fall 2019, I, uh, did an internship at Bloomberg, uh, covering economy down in DC, um, which is really great. And that definitely, uh, came about because, uh, you know, uh, Professor Young would have like recruiters come to campus, like the Bloomberg, you know, uh, internship, uh, recruiter was, uh, coming a couple times and stuff. And I remember like one time, you know, three or four of us all went to Casa or something and got a beer. So, um, you know, definitely, you know, came about from these like networking opportunities. And how did you score that internship in Tunisia? I know the oh, yeah, story, sure. but I want the students to hear this. Yeah, uh, there, there's a, I guess a scholarship program. Uh, I'm not sure if it's st still going. Um, yes. But, oh yeah, cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I just, you know, applied and, um, you know, from that course that I uh, talked about earlier, like, really enjoyed, you know, covering Tunisia. So I was like, all right, let's, uh, you know, try to go for it. And, um, yeah, 
I guess uh, they just interview you and, uh, you know, uh, I guess that's the, the application process, but the internship itself, um, I had followed a guy on Twitter um, and uh, he had been covering, he's like a, an American living there and was covering this space and he had written for like the Washington Post a bunch um, and the New York Times and stuff. So I um, sent him a DM on Twitter and, you know, told him about the scholarship and how I, you know, uh, would love to intern for his like journalism startup about Tunisia that was like in English and Arabic. Um, so uh, yeah, he was like, yeah, we can, you know, use some help. And so um, went there and just wrote about, you know, economy, culture, um, stuff like that. So. And for those of you wondering about that foreign language requirement, Will speaks French, so that was very helpful because like French in, yeah. is one of the languages <laughs> in Tunisia. Right, right. Um, so you, helpful, so yeah. you were being an entrepreneur finding and then later working for an entrepreneur in Tunisia. Definitely, definitely, okay, yeah. Very cool. Meryl, from the time I first met her, said, you know, I want to go to New York uh, so I can see Broadway shows. Not sure how I'm going to get there, what I'm going to do, but, you know, New York was her, her destination from the get-go. So tell us about your internships, please. Um, after my freshman year, I did, um, it was called the USA Today Co uh, Collegiate Correspondence Program. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think I had heard about from someone else um, in the Post newsroom who had maybe done it or known someone, I can't remember exactly, but that was another thing of, I wouldn't have known to even apply to it had I not been around people who were constantly applying to different things, which was also the benefit of, um, you know, constantly being around a group of, you just always like hear those things of what everyone else is working toward and you can kind of expand where you're looking for. Um, and I think I did, I did a social media internship after my sophomore year. Um, and as well as like a blogging, um, it was a small website that I don't think is uh, live now anymore, but, um, and that was entertainment reporting. So those were all virtual, um, back before like virtual was the norm, uh, which was fun. And then after my junior year, I went to Columbus and did the Columbus Dispatch, um, and I was a features intern there, which was really exciting to kind of see the parallels of like different newsrooms, but obviously on a you know professional level and to see um, what it would be like in terms of the real world and not just in Baker Center. Um, and so that was really exciting and fun to get to just like really go on the ground and like they let me use the cars to like drive around Columbus and I was like, what's going on here? Um, but it was fun. It was really cool to get to just be so like um, on the ground and get to be in a different place because I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh and so like Columbus was new and different. <laughs> and so um, it was really cool. And then after, um, you know, I was about to graduate, I had had a friend who was working at, um, or I think at the time she was at Insider, because um, this is back when we had like different brands and there's that whole narrative that I won't go into, but um, she was on the entertainment team on Insider and had just come from an entertainment internship on Business Insider, because we had different separate brands. Um, and she recommended me. And so that was really utilizing that network um, and being able to be fortunate and get that foot in the door from there. And then um, I was an entertainment intern for, I think, three months. And then I got um, a real, like, real world moment of we went on a hiring freeze. <laughs> and it was 2016. And they were like, you know, we really need you to do social media instead for our video team on the on, under the BI brand. And I was like, as long as I still have a job, I don't care. <laughs> um, and I had done the social media certificate, which was a brand new program my senior year. I think I was like one of the first class to graduate with that certificate program. So it ended up, it was really, a, you know, funny overlap of like, it is something that was adjacent to what I'd studied, adjacent to what I was interested in, just not something I thought I was gonna be going into full time. And um, then, you know, I really just was able to kind of like build up a team from there and just like, or build out a strategy because um, they were moving me because they didn't have anybody who was doing that. Um, and so I was able to just uh, build that strategy up and then was able to be full time there. I'll just note for the students in the audience, there is a big Bobcat network at Insider. Um, when we uh, went, the, took the business reporting class up there and did the tour, it was like, hey, we're Bobcats. You know, everywhere you went, we're Bobcats, we're Bobcats. And we, said, all, we, we said, we are too. Yeah. <laughs> it's also big enough that Will and I didn't even really know each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's how big it's gotten, which is really exciting. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was uh, a startup. A guy was like, ah, I want to start this. And Insider is a full fledged player in news coverage and a leader. 
Um, so that entrepreneurial spirit. Meryl, you've, you've pretty much walked us through your journey to where you are now. Um, Will, so how did you end up at Insider after all these great internships? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, it was like the, the start of the pandemic. I came back to Athens to finish my master, master's thesis in like January, February 2020. And then, uh, you know, all that time was applying for some jobs and some like internships. Uh, you know, it wasn't quite sure, you know, I don't know what I was going to do. And then obviously the pandemic starts and I was like in New York uh, interviewing at like CNBC and Forbes on like March 13th or something like that. And then they like canceled like, uh, yeah, both of them or one of them. And then uh, they were both like, yeah, we're gonna like pause all hiring because we don't know what's happening. It's like crap. So then uh, again on Twitter, uh, I saw uh, one of the editors at Insider uh, putting out a freelance request. Mm -hmm. And so I was just looking for, you know, work experience and stuff and, uh, you know, responded to this uh, tweet. And then she sent me an email and um, wrote like a freelance piece. Uh, for the investing team and then uh, you know the editor was like oh you should apply for this internship and um, so yeah so summer 2020 started internship and then uh, like January 2021 uh, got offered the full-time job and then just stayed there ever since. All right terrific. Um, what's the best part of the job you have now? And if you want to say snacks free snacks I mean that's fine too but what's the best part of the job you have now? We did just get a fresh fruit back in the kitchen. It's pretty, pretty oh, great. Nice. I, didn't know. Um, <laughs> I, I really like working across all the different departments that I do. It's really exciting to get to understand the business in all the different realms and having come from edit and getting to really understand. I, I feel it hopefully every like facet of the way that the company works. Um, so it's really exciting to get to do that and um learn all the different ways that like people approach things because you have to from the different departments and then kind of trying to find the common ground and narrative within that to see like how i can use all of these departments to get our new business you know uh launch or whatever it may be and just um seeing how everyone can kind of work together yeah and then for me it probably i like uh it's a very um like you said entrepreneurial kind of newsroom uh we pitch basically all of our own stories um, you know, we frame the story, uh, build the story in the content management system. Um, so it's, I don't know, really like a comprehensive, uh, I guess, experience and you have to, uh, you know, just be super, uh, in, uh, sort of like industrial, or I guess in the way of like, you're, I don't know, you're constantly planning stuff and you're, you you know, basically you have a hand on every facet of the story that you produce okay. at Insider compared to, um, you know, other publications, I think it's more. Um, you just write the story and then you know pass it off the editor and then someone else puts it in the CMS or whatever and they publish it. So I think at Insider you have uh, you know hands on more areas of the uh, of you know your day to day job I guess. Which we hope is better quality control since you're the expert on the story. Sure, sure. Okay, all right, great. Um, what advice do you have for today's students? We'll start with Will. Um, yeah, I, I think just, uh, be really like tenacious in taking all the opportunities that you can. Like I remember when the Bloomberg recruiter, for example, came, uh, to campus, uh, this must've been winter 2018. Uh, I had like a, a, a ton of work to do and I was like, I, I don't know if I can you know, make this, but, uh, you know, professor young was like, oh, we're going to Casa for, for a drink, you know, after the presentation, I was like, all right, I can just carve out this one hour. Uh, you know, this would be a good like opportunity to go you know, meet this person or whatever. And, um, you know, that definitely helped me, uh, you know, uh, in, in the interview process and stuff in, in, in uh, getting that internship. So, uh, you know, just, yeah, take the opportunities, uh, you know, uh, whenever they present themselves, I think is the best advice I could give. And I will say to your credit, you took advantage of the opportunity that Bloomberg provided uh, for a week's training at the DC Bureau. Totally, uh, totally. Gave up a week of winter break. It was freezing cold. Uh, the reflecting pool at the National Mall was frozen over. People were playing hockey on it. 
and we were walking around DC looking like abominable snow people. Um, so, you know, if you you get it, sometimes you have to give up a little bit to to gain some things. Uh, they flew in people from Europe uh, to do training sessions. So, to your credit, you were willing to give up a, a week of winter break to be able to have that experience. Yeah, totally. I think uh, OU, you know, gives a ton of opportunities like this. So, yeah, just you know, jump at them all and. Um, yeah, I think OU is definitely lucky. Like where I went to undergrad, it was it was great, but you know it's much smaller school, and um, you know definitely fewer opportunities than than in, in journalism at least. Um, you know that we have at OU, so definitely you guys are lucky to take advantage of it. Uh, you know while you can for sure. Okay, Meryl, what advice would you give students? I think as best as you can, be ready for change. I think I mean. When I went to uh, Business Insider, I was like, I have this really sappy post on Instagram of like, I'm moving to New York City, I'm fulfilling my dream, I'm gonna be an entertainment reporter, it's really embarrassing. And then that like happened in three months, right? So I think, um, you know, just be open and as things come your way, you know, like you said, like take the opportunities, but also, you know, that change is really scary. And it's, I'm not saying that when I switch from entertainment to social media that I was, thrilled I was you know I was definitely nervous and I was like this isn't what I was thinking I was going to do and after that kind of just initial shock a little bit wore off I was like wait here's the opportunity I have to take this on and being the type a person that I am I was like I can carve out this whole strategy and like make a position for myself um, so I think just knowing I think when I was in school I was like I'm going to be a reporter I'm like hardcore news and info track and you know kind of maybe a little tunnel vision which was maybe a disadvantage of not realizing like how big it could be and how different um, of roles there are in media. It's not just reporting and thinking, you know, the whole picture of a newsroom. It's, you know, edit is uh, a big position, you know, composition of it. For us, I think it's like a, a good majority at Insider are reporters versus any of the like business side or tech and product, um, which is kind of, I think, unique. Not a lot of newsrooms are not always like that because of legacy things and whatnot, um, but we're, a digital startup and savvy like that so um but i think it's interesting to think about those other components that can um you know funnel a newsroom okay um will's bio dropped a few names of people you have interviewed and i did not pronounce them all correctly i don't think um but why should we care about those people tell us who they are Tell us why covering business news matters to those in the audience. Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, those people are, um, you know, various like, you know, equity strategists at, at top banks like Bank of America, for example, or, um, you know, one's a, an economist at Harvard, who used to be the chief economist at the IMF. Uh, one of them's the, you know, top uh, bond manager at BlackRock. Um, so these people are the smartest you know, uh, names in the market, they're always on Bloomberg, CNBC. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, why people pay attention to what they want to say, have, uh, what they have to say, uh, manage a ton of money and stuff. So, um, but yeah, I mean, why you should pay attention to business news. I mean, it impacts, you know, everyone's life and, you know, everyone needs to, like, my beat is investing, I guess. So I guess we're focused on the retail investor and everyone, you know, needs to save for retirement and stuff and, you know, ought to um, invest at least broadly. So. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, the market's developing day to day and the over macro, overall macroeconomic picture is constantly changing. So, um, you know, it's important to be on top of trends in the market and, you know, how to adjust your portfolio or, yeah. So. Do you give free stock tips? <laughs> They're not free. You gotta, you gotta subscribe. So, <laughs> okay. um, oh. you subscribe, yeah. <laughs> Uh, for students in the audience who are thinking, we well, you know maybe I only have ten dollars left at the end of the week. Why should they care about investing? And um, if you're not going to give free stock tips, maybe give a little bit of free advice on why you need to think about investing now. Let's just you know, bring this whole discussion down to home, so to speak. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, arguably the most important uh, factor of investing uh, is you know timeline. So. Uh, you know, if you start investing when you're 25, for example, fresh out of college with your first job, uh, you know, by the time you're 65, um, you know, basically like you have this, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, exponential sort of energy that uh, compound interest. <laughs> exactly, I think. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know. So you know, the more your fund grows, uh, you know, the more interest you can generate, and it sort of spirals upward. Um, so you know, yeah, you want to start investing. Uh, you know, young. Why uh, time is on your side. Um, also, you know, markets go up and down, up and down, up and down. But generally, across uh, you know a long time period, they go up. So um, you know, it's important to uh, you know invest early so you can sort of ride out all of these ups and downs and ups and downs. Okay, uh, Merrill, you you dropped a few company names in your bio: Facebook, Yahoo, Taboola, Microsoft, YouTube. So what exactly do you do in your job that allows you to have interaction with these companies? Explain what you do, please. Yeah, for sure. Um, basically, we like to talk about business development as we help to pay for more journalism. That's kind of really the main goal of our team is taking the single value. Um, Wells reporting is mostly behind the paywall, so this is the exact this example, but like a single story um, in front of the paywall, which is available to read on our site, we try to extend the life of that, extend the value of it, so that we can get the most value and then help to pay for more reporters, basically. Um, the whole aim is to just fund the journalism and fund the newsroom um, and just try to get the most value out of it. So what we do is we work with uh, Microsoft or Yahoo for stories. Um, our content will also live on those sites because there's massive readers um, who don't know to come to insider.com, right? And that's the other main element of, I mean, our team, but also just Insider as a company is, we're not gonna try to force you to one place to read. The internet is vast and it would be such a waste and you would lose so many people and potential readers and you know maybe people who would really engage with our brand just if you're trying to get them to one place. And so instead, if they're on MSN, if they're on Yahoo, they're definitely on Facebook, they're on YouTube, you know, put our videos, put our stories out there and get them where they are instead of trying to funnel them to one place because you're just going to lose so many people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just trying to expand the reach of our content um, and then also, you know, get all those readers to understand who what Insider is and uh, read our great stuff. So are those companies paying you like a subscription fee to be able to use your content and that's how you generate revenue for Insider? Uh, like licensing, it's yeah, okay. not necessarily a subscription, but it's all very symbiotic also. Like, okay. you know, if they don't have good relationships with publishers and publishers don't have good relationships with these partners, they're not gonna have the content. We're not gonna have a place to extend the value of our stories. Um, and so we're all trying to kind of work together. Um, and, you know, MSN.com has uh, tons and tons of readers mm -hmm. and reach. And that's not something that like every site is going to have. So everyone can kind of go into that and get advantage of all the people that are already there. Um, and but you know, MSN only has all of those people because they have tons of great publishers who are, you know, putting their content on places like that. And same with YouTube. I mean, obviously, there's a huge creator market. Um, and everybody can be a creator nowadays, although not necessarily because that's an incredibly hard job. Um, but like theoretically, anybody could put something on YouTube. But, you know, publishers driving on site video is so difficult. So YouTube is like such a great tool because it's made for video um, and has been around for forever. And so reaching all the people that are already there instead of trying to get them to, to one place. Are you on TikTok? for work technically but um i'm one of the few, i'm like this is where i'm like old and i'm like i watch my TikToks on instagram like a good <laughs> you know millennial now <laughs> but um so i meant is the company on TikTok? yes putting content <laughs> <laughs> speaking of going where people are <laughs> yes we have quite a few handles at insider um <laughs> give us a follow um but yeah we i mean we try to be it that it really is we try to be where everybody is and something like TikTok is such a huge opportunity there's so much um of an especially like a very engaged audience there um and so you know anytime that we see like those trends kind of come up we try to get everywhere we can obviously mm -hmm. there's resourcing that goes into it so we have to be smart and see like what we can get a yield out of um but you know we try to try to get everywhere we can are you pulling back from Facebook a little bit since more people are moving toward TikTok? In fact, some people have abandoned Twitter since Musk took over. So when you're thinking strategically, strategically and social media, are you looking at, okay, we're going to decrease our presence there and increase it on TikTok? I mean, give us, give us some of the 
the planning and discussion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are certain signals of, you know, Facebook is deprecating instant articles. There are just like clear things of where the platforms are prioritizing different, um, whether it's video or reels or stories or whatever, it, there's always something that like a platform will prioritize and you just have to learn to pivot that, right? You have to pivot around. If you get stuck and you're like, well, no, we do this and we have to do this on Facebook and it has to be done this way. We've done it this way for X number of years. You're not going to do well. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to adjust and see like, okay, they're prioritizing reels. How can we use that to our advantage? How can we adapt our storytelling to that format? Because um, it's an entirely different format. Um, and figuring out, you know, how you can make it make sense for for the business. We are, you know, that is definitely a big case of it. Of we want to pivot. You want to be able to try all these different things, but you can't just like. I mean, these are reporters and producers. Like they are working here. They have goals. Like you have to think about the, this thing too of like how it can make sense for them, um, how it can make sense for the company as a whole to make sure that like their time is valued. Um, but definitely, as I mean, you know, Twitter is a new thing every day it's a fun thing to see what he decides to tweet <laughs> each day and see like what the new um you know uh point of the of the platform will be but it's just about trying to stay on your toes and you can't kind of get too like it's good to be have a strategy in place and have a plan but you can't get too married to it you have to be able to adapt are you living and dying by analytics or analytics is piece a piece of the discussion or does it drive the discussion I mean, Insider is a very data-driven company. Um, on my side, I mostly work with data and analytics and looking at our partners and looking to see like how the different partners are trending, um, how we can do more, if yesterday was a good day, bad day, or things like that, what's doing well, how can we do more of that, what's not hitting that we expected to hit, things like that. Um, and I think it's similar on in the newsroom. But. For sure, yeah. Uh definitely uh, more you know data focused than uh, other firms I've been at like um, yeah and it just helps you know inform your your coverage so you're not you know writing something that no one reads um, you know so yeah yeah I'll do a quick um, our editor-in-chief Nick Carlson will do like his famous Venn diagram of you know write what you want to write and what the audience knows and then find that overlap here mm -hmm. And you know, it's um, I'm a big metaphor person, so I've always stuck with it's always stuck with me. But I think it's you know the, the only way that you can succeed is when you have people who are interested in what they're reporting about, but then also finding like what is doing well to perform well, so that everything is moving in the right direction. Because you can, there's always going to be that overlap somewhere. Um, but I think, you know, it's you need to use the data so that you can be successful and efficient, and you know, be there for a, the long term. That's the thing. If you're only mm -hmm. thinking about the short term, it's probably not going to work out too well. Yeah, got to use those resources wisely. Yeah. Will, what's a typical day like for you on the job? Uh, sure, yeah. So like, um, it depends, I guess, if I had something planned before, uh, like if I'd done an interview like earlier, earlier in the week that I know, you know, that I'll, I can get a story out of. Um, but yeah, I'll, you know, typically wake up, uh, you know, read some, you know, notes from, from banks, you know, research notes they'll put out on on stocks or um, you know the economy, and um, sort of try to find nuggets of uh, information that would be good for a story. So, for example, like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, um, every Monday morning we'll publish a big note, and pretty much all the big banks do. But those you know are probably two of the biggest ones that people follow, um, and they'll sort of their top strategists will sort of give their take, um, you know, on on stock market for the week, um, and you know big developments that they expect to come. So um, oftentimes they'll publish like a uh, list of stocks, you know, that are good to buy, um, you know, for the months uh, ahead. Um, so we'll hit those, you know, for stories um, pretty often. And then, uh, yeah, and then I'll, you know, constantly be trying to reach out to uh, sources, um, you know, for, for interviews and, you know, trying to get uh, one or two stories out of those uh, as well. So uh, yeah, the coverage is, is pretty broad. It's like, uh, anything that falls under the investing beat. So stocks, uh, the housing market, you know, a lot of real estate investors out there. Um, yeah, and then the broader economy also affects investing pretty heavily. So, um, you know, yeah, anything uh, under that beat, so. So you're usually turning around one to two stories a day? About one a day we, we aim okay. for, yeah. Okay, so. All right, cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about New York, because a lot of our students want to go to New York and you were students who wanted to go to New York. 
Will lives uh, on the east side of the FDR Expressway, yes. right, in Manhattan. So what was it like to go from Athens, Ohio, to New York City? Now, he did serve that terrible time at that CNBC internship in their brand new office uh, with uh, the San Francisco Bay right behind his desk because he sent me a photo. Poor thing. But uh, what was it like to go from Athens to New York City? Uh, it was great. It was awesome. Uh... For sure. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've been used to cities a little bit because uh, of San Francisco and then DC with, with Bloomberg and, mm -hmm. and stuff, um, you know, but uh, yeah, it, it was fantastic. I mean, New York is a place uh, where you can make anything happen. There's just endless opportunities. So uh, it's definitely, you know, somewhere to go if you're really entrepreneurial minded and really motivated and, you know, want to want to make a career for yourself. How long did it take you to learn the subway system? <laughs> <laughs> Probably a month or two, I would say, yeah. Uh, and then on the weekends, it always uh, is something random. It'll be like the one train's running on the D line for whatever reason. So uh, it's really, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, get on confusing. the train and see uh, where it goes. Now after three years, yeah, it's really confusing on the weekends, especially, yeah. But. Um, Meryl, what was it like? I mean, you grew up in Pittsburgh, but what was it like to go from Athens to New York City? Any advice you want to offer or? culture shock or um i so like you said i really wanted to be in new york but i had the fortune of all the um years in between like freshman year and after sophomore year and junior year i had friends who were interning in the city and so i wasn't i had maybe like virtual and so i used that to my advantage of like let me come visit and see and so i got all the very like touristy stuff out of my system and was like did all that at the top of the rock and all that stuff um which you know and also so by the time i think i visited um before my senior year and i was like no i just really like it here i just really want to be here i've gotten all that out of my system and i'm still really interested in being here and i think that would be important like if you have a place in mind trying to visit if you can if you have the ability to do that just so you can kind of get those nerves out of the way before you're there um, because then when i landed i like had a few and also if you are able to get like you know, hopefully you can have a few people who are there I, I found that really helpful because i'm you know more uh introverted person so having a, a group of people there uh, just to get me out of my shell right away, I think was was really helpful. Um, but definitely, if you can, wherever, if you have a place in mind, I would try to get there a little bit, to, you know, tour around and um, get the the nerves out of your system. Um, speaking of a group of friends, were was it the Bobcat Network at Insider that that became your friends circle, or how did you make those connections for I mean, your personal life away from the job? Um, there were people who were at Insider, um, there were people who were from OU but not at Insider, which was also nice, so it wasn't like such a tiny bubble, because mm -hmm. it's, you know, I mean, New York is massive, but it's also incredibly small, the fact that so many, you know, Bobcats are there and we all run into each other a lot. Um, so I think just, you know, finding the people that you can kind of, at the end of the day, just like get everything out of, out of your system and um, have people who like understand what you're going through and you can talk through um, and having those shared experiences, I think, uh, has really just been monumental for me. Will, how did you develop a, a support circle of friends away from the job? Yeah, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, there's so many people in New York and, you know, if you go to, you know, a, a party or something, um, it's pretty easy to meet people and, um, you know, some of my main friends, you know, just met at a, you know, small like house party or whatever and just, you know, do it off and uh, let's hang out next weekend or whatever again. Just uh, I think it's pretty easy to build up a, uh, you know, network of friends uh, there pretty quickly. So at this point, if you have questions, we want to invite you to the microphone in the center aisle. And if you want to just uh, form a queue, that'll be fine. Um, we want to save some time for audience Q&A, and while you're deciding whether you want to come uh, to the podium, uh, I'm going to ask uh, another question of our panelists. Um, Will, what do you think is next for you? I mean, where do you see yourself in five years? And you don't have to say a particular employer or anything like that. We're not out to get dirt or promote insider either way. It's just where do you see your career going and, and what's your next objective yeah i mean uh, i just want to keep you know progressing and get getting better at my job uh first off uh you know but i also have a big goal to go back overseas 
Um, and so, you know, I've shared this with the insider and stuff, and we have bureaus in Singapore and, and London. Um, so I'd really like to, to go to one of those if possible. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what opportunities come up. I think both bureaus are growing. They're both, uh, especially Singapore is fairly small, I think, mm -hmm. uh, as of now. And um, so, yeah, uh, we'll see what opportunities come up. But yeah, I think that's uh, maybe another uh, main objective in the next five years or so that I would love to, to tackle. Okay, great. Meryl, you you started out on the reporting side and now you're in the business office. So where do you think you're going to go next? Yeah, I mean, I learned years ago, I just five year plans are really not my thing, apparently, because things just kind of get thrown my way. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, it's it's been it's been such a fun journey and it's been really exciting and it's just something I really never, ever thought I would do. So I don't even, I kind of am just like, you know, obviously I have um, plans in mind of wh where I think I could go, but I just, I don't want to set anything in stone. I just think, you know, it's it's more fun um, to kind of see things as they come up. Um, mm -hmm. And I think with how media is, it's you can barely plan a few months out in advance, let alone a year. So, you know, I, I don't really have a five-year plan. <laughs> okay. Well, you don't have to have a five-year plan. I just wondered if you had like yeah. a, a career goal or career objective that you were looking at. Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, the reason I'm in business development is I um, have a, a boss who I just know that I can learn under for the next few years. And so that's really my thing is I, the pivots that I've made, there's always been an element of, well, I can really learn from this. And so, you know, when I was moving from being uh, leading the social video team, it was because I had done it for years and I had built up the strategy and there were still opportunities and challenges, of course, because social media is an incredibly complex job every day. Um, but it was just at a point where I was like, I just want something new. I want a new challenge and a new environment to learn in. And so wherever that is, is kind of where I'm, I'm hoping to go. All right. That sounds terrific. Is that Caroline? Yes, it is. Okay. Caroline, please go ahead with your Hello. question. Well, am I talking too loud right now? You're fine. All right. Go ahead. Will, this question is for you. So I'm interested in your time at the University of Leipzig. Sure. Um, what are the benefits of getting a degree in a foreign country and what kind of hands on experience did you get as a part of that? Yeah, I, I think it just like really broadens your perspective. Like, uh, you know, uh, I I'd studied in France for one semester in undergrad and I love that. So that was like a big thing that drew me to, to OU was this Leipzig uh, program. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I think it just uh, you know opens up your eyes to how different countries work and how like I don't know I think I think if you've you know only been in the U.S. or only been in one country or whatever uh, you sort of just have an idea of how the world works and it totally changes when you live uh, for a longer time you know in in, a, in another country so um, yeah and then just obviously language wise as well like you know can, uh, I think I spent eight months or so in Leipzig and uh, you know picked up a decent level of uh, German, at least reading wise. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it just helps you understand, uh, you know, political and economic, uh, you know, uh, and cultural, I uh, guess, uh, trends in, in the world and how it works. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Definitely do it if you have the opportunity. <laughs> That's one of her goals. Oh, so, nice. nice. Okay. Do we have other questions from the audience or other speakers who are in the house? I guess that means you did a good job. Nobody has a question. That means that you answered everything in the interview, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to do that one question. I always encourage students to save for last when they're doing an interview. Is there anything else you want to add? Um, I mean, I just, it's so fun to be back here and just remember the sort of just weirdness of it all and just like this intensity that you have because it's so fun and I would just it's so stressful I know right now but I think just like enjoy it and um you know one day you all could be <laughs> on this and I think it's just really exciting to get to be at a place that values the network and to, that values um not just your time when you're here in the four years but really I feel you know I, I feel just as much uh this is I promise they didn't pay me to say this. I feel just as much of a bobcat now as I did, you know, those years ago because it just it's so it's such a core part of my identity of my time here and um I don't I just value it forever. Will? Yeah, I would say, you know, uh similar to New York, I think Athens uh you know has a, a 
you know, a ton of people that are really uh, motivated to, you know, to do big things and, um, you know, take advantage of that energy and all the opportunities that the, the school, you know, has to offer uh, for sure while you're here. I'd say it's my number one takeaway. Okay. First, we want to thank Smith and Patricia Schooneman. Uh, two alumni who uh, donated money to have the Schooneman Symposium series. Uh, there was a little bit of money left over after we finished that series last spring. And so we were able to provide this symposium this spring. So we want to give a shout out to Smith and Patricia Schooneman. Please give a round of applause to them. And we also want to thank our panelists for this session, Meryl Gottlieb and Will Edwards, please. <laughs>